Let me give you a very, very warm welcome to this inaugural lecture of the Living Well with Technology Thought Leadership Series presented by the Digital Futures Institute here at King's College London. I'm Marion Thane and I'm Professor of Culture and Technology and I lead the Digital Futures Institute and I'm just going to say a little bit about the Digital Futures Institute and the Living Well with Technology Thought Leadership Series before I pass over to my collaborator Marcus Weldon who is then going to introduce Stephen Fry. So we're going to do a little instructions relay here but we'll get on to the main, the main act very soon I promise. So the Digital Futures Institute is part of a network of futures institutes across the UK and what we're trying to do is change the conversation in terms of how we think about new technologies and what we do with them. And this project really is about avoiding um, being blinded by tech optimism, but it's equally about refusing going down a cul-de-sac of negative hand-wringing that doesn't result in any kinds of solutions. So we want to forge a middle path between those two things. We also want to recast what are generally seen as technical problems requiring only technical fixes, as human and social problems that require much broader ways of knowing, making, and understanding. So we're bringing together all of the disciplines, many areas of expertise, to make a step change in the way we respond to these challenges. Rather, bringing our, our colleagues in informatics into dialogue with our colleagues in humanities, social sciences, um, health, business, and trying to have a really different method of approaching some of these challenges. We're also wanting to have a conversation across sectors. So to get people speaking to one another who don't normally speak to one another, and to get representatives from health, from culture, from the creative sectors, from industry, from policy, as well as obviously higher education, all in the same conversation, because we believe that these challenges that we're facing now need that multifaceted perspective in order to, for us to really find systemic um, solutions and really proper uh, modes to a more just, more equitable, more sustainable digital future. So the Thought Leadership Series then is a platform for this new kind of conversation, a crucible for bringing some of these voices together. And I could not be more delighted to have Stephen Fry as our inaugural speaker. What better voice to represent our ambitions in this space? Um, a huge thank you to you, Stephen, for being with us tonight. And before I pass over and we start to hear from Stephen, I just want to do one last thing, which is to introduce my collaborator, Dr. Mar Dr. Marcus Weldon, who, as I say, will in turn introduce Stephen. And it's been a really great pleasure over this past year to work with Marcus and um, to have such a wonderful co-conspirator in bringing about this new thought leadership series. And I think together we re really do represent this collaboration between uh, university and industry that I think is absolutely essential to help us take forward the work that we want to do. And Marcus is a renowned innovation leader with more than 25 years experience in cutting edge science and technology research and innovation. And his career culminated in the role of the 13th president of the esteemed Bell Labs, as well as the role of chief technology officer of Alcatel Lucent and Nokia corporations. And since 2021, Marcus has been uh, advising companies and institutions actually of all sizes on techno-economic strategies for leadership for the coming digital age. More important than all of that though, Marcus is actually a graduate of this very institution. Uh, Marcus is an alum of King's College London, graduating with a BSc in chemistry, was it chemistry and informatics? Computer science. Computer science. Um, and an alumnus that King's is rightly uh, incredibly proud of. So Marcus, we're also delighted to have you with us. I'm gonna pass over to you and Stephen for the rest of this evening. Thank you. I remember taking an exam in this hall. I was, a, I was a successful student, not necessarily the most diligent, but we'll draw 
a veil over that. Um, so why am, I, why am I up here? Uh, my relationship with Stephen actually goes back a long way, longer than he realizes. Uh, probably 20, 25 years ago, as a result of me consuming all of his books, TV shows, quiz mastery, and general musings, I became aware of the fact that I uh, had what is nowadays called a dose of the fanboy. <laughs> and if you remember, back in the 1990s, some of you, in fact many of you I think will remember that time, there was a popular expression, WWJD. Remember what that, what would Jesus do? Well, I'm of the secular type, and so that didn't really resonate with me, but I realized I had my own version, which was WWSS, which was what would Stephen say? So uh, that, that really then led me on this journey, which when I became president of Bell Labs, I started, uh, and Bell Labs, of course, uh, innovator extraordinaire, foundational technologies that underpin the, the digital economy, uh, I needn't list them, I think you know them. But at, at some point I decided to reinstitute a lecture series in honor of the renowned uh, information theorist, Claude Shannon. And that lecture series would invite preeminent thinkers of the day to discuss and prognosticate and provoke uh, alternative theses about the future beyond what the scientists in Bell Labs were thinking about. And so, one of the perks of being the president of Bell Labs, probably also being vice chancellor of King's, is you're quite well connected to the alumni of that institution. And Bell Labs has been around since 1924 and is massively connected. Tens of thousands of uh, esteemed people have passed through its hallowed halls. So I could find within two steps, remember the six degrees of separation, with, normally within two degrees of separation, I could find a connection. So actually I found a connection to Stephen's sister, Joe, who is here today, who kindly uh, queried Stephen to see if he'd be willing to come and give one of these Shannon lectures. And the topic of the time, which he agreed to, was actually very pertinent. So this story is going somewhere. Uh, it was part one of what of today's talk in some ways. It was a talk on uh, what at that time, I think seven years ago, the multiverse was what we were thinking about. But that multiverse was mobile and, and cloud-based and AR, VR-based and Machiavellian and all uh, these interesting attributes and AI-enabled. And at that time, it was just classical AI, which seemed to be able to do image recognition, a bit of voice recognition. But Stephen gave this wonderful talk that you can watch on YouTube as everything lives on in digital infamy. But uh, part one of the talk today, in which his essential conclusion was he had no answers, so don't expect answers today. But the observation was that we needed to better explore Moravec's paradox, which is the inherent sort of commonality, complementarity of humanity and machine. Machines are intrinsically good at some things, humans intrinsically good at a complementary set. And as we faced all these exponentially growing technologies, we needed to work out who we were as humans. So those exponential growth curves that could look like walls and imprison us actually became support structure for human endeavor. So that was where we left it. And he had a clarion call at the end is that to do that, we have to work together in new ways, which now you see how it ties to Marion's initiative and the Digital Futures Institute. We have to have a multidisciplinary humanistic technological, social science, medicine-based approach to understanding who we are as humans and how we can interact with these emergent technologies. So when Marion asked me uh, to, to take a role here and said, who could we have as the, the thought leader that will kick off this series? Of course, I said, WWSS. What would Stephen say? And, and that brought me to again uh, ask Stephen once more if he would, uh, he would take uh, the challenge of ringing that clarion bell again, and this time, maybe the time is right, with the advent of generative AI and the overt power and peril represented by generative AI, that, that we could actually collectively ring that bell and have our voices heard and have the right actions taken not ones that are overly pessimistic, 
and not the utopian idealistic position either. So that's what we're going to do today. I actually have no idea what he's going to say. I hope he's going to say something along those lines. But what I will say is this is part deux. Uh, it's going to be wonderful. If this were a die-hard movie series, I guess we would call it AI Harder. But that, that's what we're going to hear. Stephen is going to talk about whether AI is the means to an end or a means to the end. And without any more from me, you've heard quite enough, I would like to welcome the one and only Stephen Fry. Thank you so much. Oh, my word. Thank you, Marion, and thank you, Marcus. What an extraordinary introduction, up to which I will never live, but thank you anyway. Um, so many questions, and the first you're probably going to ask is, by what right do I stand before you and presume to lecture an already knowledgeable and distinguished crowd on the subject of AI and its meaning, its bright promise, and or exclusive, or its dark threat? Well, perhaps by no greater right than anyone else, but no lesser either. We'll come to whose voices are the most worthy of attention later. But I've been interested in the subject of artificial intelligence since around the mid-80s, in fact, when I was fortunate enough to encounter the so-called father of AI, Marvin Minsky, and to read his book, The Society of Mind. Intrigued, I devoured as much as I possibly could on the subject, learning about the expert systems and uh, bundles of agency that were the vogue then. And I followed the subject with enthusiasm and gaping wonder ever since. But I promise you that makes me neither expert, sage, nor oracle. For if you're preparing to hear wisdom, to witness and receive insight this evening, to bask and bathe in the light of prophecy, clarity, and truth, then it grieves me to tell you that you've come to the wrong shop. Uh, you will find little of that here. For you must know that you're being addressed this evening by nothing more than an ingenuous simpleton, a dunce, a naive fool, a ninny hammer, an adulpated oaf, a dullard and a double-dyed dolt. But before you streak for the exit, bear in mind that we are all, all of us, bird-brained half-wits when it comes to this subject, no matter what our degrees, doctorates, and decades of experience. I can at least congratulate myself, perhaps, with the fact that I am aware of my idiocy. It's not fate modesty designed to make me come across as a sort of Socrates, but that great Athenian did teach us that the first step to wisdom is the realization of our folly. I'll come to the proof of how and why I'm so boneheaded in a moment. But before I go any further, I'd like to paint some pictures. Think of them as tableau vivant, played onto a screen at the back of your mind. We'll return to them from time to time. Of course, I could have generated these images from Mid Journey or Dali or similar and projected them behind me on the screen. But the very small window of time in which it was amusing and instructive for speakers to use AI as an entertaining trick for talks concerning AI has thankfully closed. You're actually going to have to use your brain's own generative latent diffusion skills to summon these images. Image one. Picture the human family at the seaside, our backs to the ocean, building sandcastles, playing beach cricket, having a fine time in the sun. Behind us, unseen on the horizon, huge currents are converging, separate but each feeding and swelling the others to form one unimaginably colossal tsunami. These are the currents of quantum computing, of genomics and gene editing, of bio-augmentation and bionics, of duplex brain-machine interfacing, of robotics, of new materials, graphene, perovskite, carbon nanotubes, self-healing polymers, and many others. And of course, the most swollen current of them all, the technologies and processes behind what we call artificial intelligence. 
I summoned this image of the tsunami on the horizon in a talk I gave on AI eight years ago, I think it was, at the Hay on Wai Literary Festival. I thought maybe we should turn around and at least get a sense of what was coming behind us. But it was too early and the tidal wave seemed too far away. No one really believed me. I did suggest that the best thing that could happen would be for universities, professions, and businesses to take a year off, to realign their courses and syllabuses and practices and recalibrate their teaching, staffing, training, and examining in preparation for what was coming. It was a ridiculous suggestion. Obviously, it was never gonna happen, but it, in fact, bizarrely, and spookily, that Wuhan wet market in 2019 provided exactly such an opportunity. Not that any institution did take advantage of the COVID years to recalibrate, of course. After all, ChatGPT wasn't yet launched and a tipping point in public awareness hadn't been reached. The second picture to keep in your mind, we are in a field in the rural heart of the Cotswolds just outside the village of Kemble in Gloucestershire. The grass is strangely wet and marshy beneath our feet. There's a small bubbling spring there, which trickles into a stream that runs down the field and out of sight. A stone marker reads, this stone was placed here to mark the source of the River Thames. Image three. The third picture to fix in our heads takes us off to the German town of Mannheim in 1895. We're gathered in a converted stable belonging to an enterprising fellow called Karl Bentz. He's anxious to show us his new invention, a kind of engine that he calls his Verbrennungsmotor. This device is attached to a slightly modified horse carriage. Herr Benz tells us that his engine is powered not by steam, but by a very newly available hydrocarbon product that the French are calling essence, the Americans gasoline, and we British petroleum spirits, or petrol for short. Benz cranks a handle around. He, there is sputtering, banging, and much smoke. He runs round, sits himself in the carriage, pulls some levers, turns some knobs, and the strange machine lurches a little before juddering slowly forward. We follow him out of the garage where he comes to a stop, beaming proudly in a cloud of oily blue smoke. Now, you and I are in that group, all of us. What do we say? Most of us smile, shake our heads. But well, yes, it's very impressive, no doubt. But what kind of range does such a machine have compared to a horse? Where is the infrastructure to operate, feed, maintain it that can compete with the stables, the coaching inns, the water troughs, and feeding stations that already proliferate around the globe? Where are the trained ostlers, grooms, and coach builders to operate and look after these horseless carriages? Where are the roadways that can compete with railways? A few in our group might concede that a limited market of rich hobbyists could have fun with these machines, but we can guarantee this. Not one of us would declaim, yes, I foresee interstate highways three or four lanes wide, crisscrossing the nations. I foresee flyovers, bypasses, Grand Prix motor racing, traffic lights, roundabouts, parking structures, 10, 20 stories high, traffic wardens, whole towns and cities entirely shaped by these contrivances. No one would have seen a thousandth part of such a future. You may have noticed, if you're clever, and I'm sure you are, that the last two images I've tried to conjure are, in essence, the same. The gathering in Mannheim is pretty much identical in its form and meaning to the gathering at Thames Head Kemble, where the rivulet begins its journey. You surely could not, never having seen its final destination, imagine that the dribble in Kemble would become mighty Father Thames, processing under grand London bridges as he flows broadly 
to his estuary in Essex and Kent, any more than you could imagine that the belching and wheezing contraption of Benzies would transform the 20th century, or indeed that the company he founded with the addition of the name of one of his investor's daughters, Mercedes, would one day be worth the best part of $100 billion. An important and relevant point is this. It wasn't so much the genius of Benz that created the internal combustion engine as that of Vladimir Shukov. In 1892, the Russian chemical engineer found a way of cracking and refining the spectrum of crude oil from methane all the way to tar, yielding, amongst other useful products, gasoline. It was just three years later that Benz's contraption spluttered into life. Germans, in a bow to this, still called petrol benzene. John D. Rockefeller built his refineries, and surprisingly quickly, there was plentiful fuel and an infrastructure to rival the stables and coaching inns. The grateful horse, meanwhile, could be happily retired to Jim Carner's polo and royal processions. Benz's contemporary, Alexander Graham Bell, once said of his invention, the telephone, I don't think I'm being overconfident when I say that I truly believe that one day there will be a telephone in every town in America. <laughs> and I expect you've all heard that uh, Thomas Watson, the founding father of IBM, predicted that there might in the future be a world market for perhaps five digital computers. Well, that story of Thomas Watson ever saying such a thing is almost certainly apocryphal, and there's no reliable record of it, ditto the Alexander Graham Bell remark, but the sayings circulate for a reason. The Italians have a phrase for that, se non è vero è ben trovato. If it's not true, it's certainly well-founded. Those stories, like my scenario of that group of early investors clustering around the first motor car, illustrate an important truth, that we are decidedly hopeless at guessing where technology is going to take us and what it'll do to us. You might adduce as a counter-argument Gordon Moore of Intel, expounding in 1965 his prediction that semiconductor design and manufacturer would develop in such a way that every 18 months or so, they would be able to double the number of transistors that could fit in the same space on a microchip. He got that right, you might say correctly. Moore's law came true. He saw the future. Yes, but where and when did Gordon Moore foresee Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Bitcoin, OnlyFans, and the dark web? It's one thing to predict how technology changes and quite another to predict how it changes us. Technology is a verb, not a noun. It, it, it's uh, what the philosopher poet T.E. Hume called uh, a concrete flux of interpenetrating intensities. Like a river, it is ever cutting new banks, isolating new oxbow lakes, flooding new fields. And as far as the Thames of artificial intelligence is concerned, we are still in Gloucestershire, still a rivulet, not yet a river. Very soon we'll be asking around the table, who remembers chat GPT? Oh my God, you, everybody will laugh. Older people will add memories of dot matrix printers, uh, SMS texting on the Nokia 3310. We'll shake our heads in patronizing wonder at the past and its primitive clunkiness, how advanced it all seemed at the time. Those of us who can kindly be designated early adopters and less kindly called suckers, remember those pioneering days with great affection. The young internet was the all gifted, which in Greek is Pandora. Pandora, who in myth was sent down to earth, having been given by the gods all the talents. Likewise, the Pandora Internet, a glorious compendium of public museum, library, gallery, theater, concert hall, park, playground, sports field, post office, and meeting hall. Yes, with a 
a few red light districts as well, but all great cities have those. We felt like Wordsworth, perhaps. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. But we should remember that those lines come from a poem about the French Revolution, which may have begun in romantic promise, but ended in corruption, terror, and blood. Not to mention, in short order, a man called Napoleon seizing power and crowning himself emperor. I said I would come to the proof of that stupidity and naivety I accused myself of, so I'll take you back 15 or so years to a time when I found myself being invited to a perfectly extraordinary number of corporate, governmental, and media talks, conferences, summits, and such like gatherings, and I would be asked to address delegates and attendees on the subject of a new micro-blogging service that had only recently poked its timorous head up in the digital world like a delicate flower, but was already twisting and winding itself round the culture like vigorous bindweed. Twitter, it was called. I had joined early, and my name seemed permanently associated with it. What an evangel I was. Web 2.0, the user-generated web, was going great guns at this point. Tick off the years. 2003, MySpace began. 2004, Facebook launched. 2005, YouTube. 2006, Twitter. 2007, the iPhone, 2008, the App Store, and later that year, Android, and then Instagram. Bliss was it in that dawn, etc. I confidently predicted that this new kind of citizen-led computer and internet use would help build a brave and beautiful new world. Local and global rivalries will dissolve, I said. Tribal hatreds will melt away. Surely, I cried, Facebook and Twitter and this new world of social media will usher in an age of universal brotherhood and amity. And two years later, as Tunisia, then Libya, Egypt, Yemen, and Syria rose against their dictators, the Arab Spring bloomed. How right I had been, how clever and percipient I was. But... Just a year or so on, and that blissful dawn had turned into the darkest of nights. Libya leapt out of the frying pan of Gaddafi into the fire of anarchy and chaos. Egypt into a military coup, Yemen into brutal civil war, Syria into a bloodbath. Elsewhere, Brexit, Trump, TikTok, COVID, the rise of national populism and populist nationalism, state-sanctioned and criminal cyber-terrorism, epidemics of anxiety, depression, and self-harm amongst our children and young adults, and a cloud of disappointment, pessimism, mistrust, and despair over us all. Pandora had opened her box, and the ugly horrors had flown out to infect us all with hope left trapped inside. Welcome to today. <laughs> As Mark Twain or somebody like him said, history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And hilariously enough, just like the French Revolution, the Twitter Revolution also ended with a little Napoleon seizing power and crowning himself <laughs> emperor. Little Napoleon, I should say. I should go back and correct the images I evoked earlier. I now realize the tableau of us sitting with our backs to the oceans while a tidal wave gathers is not correct. When the waves of technology come, they come not in crashing tsunamis, but in creeping tides. In my homeland of Norfolk, we had long and deceptively rapid tidal reaches. We look to the horizon and see that the ocean is half a mile away. We turn to slap on some sun cream. A minute or so later, we notice that our feet are wet. Before we know it, a familiar landscape has become a seascape, and we are cut off from everything we know. The other image I should correct is that of technology starting small and becoming a broad and splendid river. Yes, we can envisage the expansion of the first trickle 
into a wide and powerful waterway. Perhaps we can envisage, too, the curves and cataracts, those oxbow lakes and sluices and the weeping willows and dragonflies kissing the current. But we are criminally foolish if we talk of rivers or of technology without recognizing the contamination, the toxic runoffs, and the raw human sewage that will pollute and poison that once clear and hopeful spring. Yuval Noah Harari's fascinating new book, Nexus, concentrates at one point on the two-word goal of the algorithms that were put to work to monetize Facebook when it moved from university bulletin board to global network and decided to pay for itself with online advertising. The two words that the algorithms were tasked with were maximize engagement. Seemed innocent enough at the time. No one predicted, neither software engineer, philosopher, sociologist, cultural commentator, nor psychologist. No one predicted that those algorithms on their journey to capture our clicks would discover that engagement is most maximized by anger, outrage, resentment, envy, fear, and hatred, the worst passions. In all of us, not just, not just our ideological enemies, but in you and me too, if we're honest. So a quick reminder of how we got here. It was Alan Turing, of course, who had planted the seeds that led to the Dartford Conference of 1956 by writing a paper on the possibility of intelligent machines. The Dartford Conference was held just two years after he so tragically took his own life. At that meeting, called together by the great Claude Shannon, whom Marcus mentioned, Marvin Minsky, and John McCarthy, the two-word phrase, artificial intelligence, was first used in our language. Love it or loathe it, it has stuck. Three years after Dartford, McCarthy and Minsky went on to found the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Artificial Intelligence Lab. Thinking machines were just around the corner, only not. By the 1980s, when Marvin Minsky was writing The Society of Mind, AI was still shivering in its so-called winter. Nothing in the field was working or making much difference in any practical sense. By the mid-1980s, development money and confidence in the field were drying up. Has AI now reached its current wow moment because of the superior brains, insights, and breakthroughs of new generations of smarter scientists, mathematicians, and coders? No, not really. Brilliant as the contributions of more recent workers in the field has been people like Jeffrey Hinton, Stuart Russell, then Andrew Ng, Jan LeCun, Demis Hassabis, Fei Fei Li, they have all enjoyed a huge and decisive advantage over Turing and Minsky and the early crowd. The playing out of Moore's law and its remorseless exponential growth has finally allowed compute power that can yield the crucial factor, the real bonanza. Compute enough to handle the explosive growth of simply gigantic fields of data that just were not there in digital form in Minsky's day. Those little integrated circuits went from hosting one, then two, then four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512 transistors to Billions in the same space. But powering our computers, tablets, and phones is almost the least that they do. I used to have a t-shirt, nerd that I am, that read, the cloud is just someone else's computer. Moore's law had allowed an unimaginably vast world of server storage and retrieval. Just as the success of the automobile was enabled by enormous supplies of crude oil, composed of microscopic bits of ancient life, rendered useful in the refineries of Rockefeller and others, so the success of AI is enabled by enormous supplies of crude data 
data composed of microscopic bits of human archive, interchange, writing, playing, communicating, broadcasting, which we in our billions have freely dropped into the sediment and which the eager Rockefellers of today's big tech are only too happy to drill for, refine, and sell on back to us. This, of course, like the petrol engine, amplifies and expands our capabilities. It will transform our social structures and networks. It will change the way we work, assemble, and communicate with each other. But does it change us? As human animals, we still have skin and bone, a liver, a heart, and a big wet walnut of a brain. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? We are born, we breed, and we die like any other life form. And in the same way we have since before the dawn of tools, language, and history. So when we talk about the existential transformations of the coming confluence of technologies, what do we really mean? We'll be the same. But the landscape around us will be different. So we mean perhaps that dread word disruption, which means breaking up, as in rupture, much as eruption means breaking out and interruption may, means breaking into. I'm sure you've all heard Mark Zuckerberg's infamous mantra, the guiding principle for Facebook as it grew, move fast and break things which went on with an, I suspect, unconscious rhyming couplet, unless you're not breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough. Yes, indeed, they moved fast, and stuff was broken, and hasn't yet been mended. Uber disrupted the urban transport space, broke it. Airbnb disrupted the uh, hotel and lodging space, broke it. Deliveroo disrupted the fast food space. Did somebody say just eat? No, nobody said it, and nobody ever will, so shut up. <laughs> Lots of spaces have been disrupted, and AI, it seems, is now poised to disrupt, well, every space we have. The clerical space, the design and creativity spaces, the screenplay and story spaces, the military and weapon spaces, the legal and judicial spaces, the medical space, the journalistic space, the educational space, and one assumes the space space. From eruption to disruption to corruption, the shiny idealism tarnished, from utopia to dystopia, those young tech pioneers with bright catchphrases like insanely great and do no evil, what are they now? Cruel corporate titans who make Montgomery Burns look like Ned Flanders. In animal farm terms, the pigs are now standing on two feet and wearing trousers. We've long been used to thinking of technology as being ethically neutral, lacking moral valency. The same press can print Shakespeare's sonnets one day and Hitler's Mein Kampf the next. The devices are not capable of making decisions, either aesthetic, ethical, or political. The NRA likes to say the same thing about guns. AI, however, is different. Intelligence is all about decision-making. That's what separates it from automated, mechanically determined outcomes. That's what separates a river from a canal. A canal must go where we tell it. A river is led by nothing but gravity. And if that means flooding a town, tough on the town. The gravity that drives AI is constituted by their goals. Unsupervised machine learning allows for unsupervised machines and for the independent agents that flow from them. We've made machines that replaced humans many times in the past. The replacement by machine of repetitive labor, whether physical or mental, we might well celebrate. Think of the thousand of mostly Irish diggers of canals, the navigators, or navvies, as they were called. They toiled at it from about 1760 to 1830. And then in 1836, Otis developed the first steam shovel, what we now call the bulldozer or digger. 
and the navvy more or less gratefully hung up his spade. Nobody feels that that was a theft and that we should send people back to manually to dig canals or anything else, trenches or any huge laboring job. The horse is not sorry about the motor car, but our labor replacement technology has moved now from grasping workers by their blue collars and booting them out to grasping them by their white collars and booting them out. And is that really what all the fuss is about? A demographic more used to getting its way is feeling the tide lap up to its toes. But surely tedious office and call center work will not be missed. Even the analyzing of x-rays and other medical images. We expect a human to have the final say today, but a machine that can look at a mammogram, say, and compare it to millions of previous images with known results and can do so in milliseconds all day long without getting bored, tired, or losing focus, that genie is never going back into the bottle. Legal work, actuarial work will certainly disrupt the judicial and insurance businesses. Is there an arena, a business, an industry, a service that won't be disrupted, that won't be broken? For sure, the kind of large language models, the LLMs, uh, that we are playing around with at the moment as standalone chat engines. We can deride them as non-sentient probabilistic mimics, stochastic parrots in computational linguist Emily Bender's great phrase. But their vocabularies, syntactical and grammatical competencies, and levels of functional comprehension are above the human average. And for a vast majority of jobs, they will more than do. And this is just now, today, with the Thames hardly out of that field in Gloucestershire. In my view, comparing AI's cognitive, creative, or intellectual powers to those of the human brain is not especially helpful. Think of the car. Again, humans can't run as fast as horses but we can build machines that far outpace them. But we do not achieve this by imitation. We don't engineer mechanical legs and hooves of the kind that took evolution 34 million years of tinkering and modification from Eohippus to the present day. We go a completely different way. We come up with something that doesn't at all exist in nature, the wheel. And instead of a mechanical heart and mechanical muscles, Carl Benz offers us the internal combustion engine and the crankshaft. Ditto with flying, traveling across or under the waves. The idea that the best engineering mimics nature is largely a myth. Yes, we look sometimes to the natural world for inspiration, certainly, but in the big things structurally, we go our own way. And as a result, we can fly higher and faster than birds, move over land quicker than a cheetah, go over and underwater faster and further than a salmon or a whale, and so on. So the use of the phrase neural network is all very well, but let's not be fooled. We must realize that there won't be a weight for AI to catch up with the human brain any more than the car is a stopgap awaiting our construction of a perfect robotic horse. I'm leaving biotech out of this argument, of course, that goes in a different direction. But by not imitating the human brain, AI of phenomenal and terrifying power can far outperform us at logic, reasoning, calculation, sorting, categorizing, summarizing. Just as the horse and carriage is by the car, we are left coughing in the dust. And machines already might be said to have the full house now of human cognitive abilities. Morovec's paradox, which Marcus mentioned, tells us that we find, what we find easy, the machines find hard. And what we find hard, the machines easy. As Donald Knut put it, AI has by now succeeded in doing essentially everything that requires thinking, but has failed to do most of what people and animals do without thinking. So what do we have left that is ours and ours alone? Sensory motor skills, 
that are all but automatic? Yes. Consciousness? Yes. Emotions, instinct, appetites, impulses, and drives. The capacity to feel pleasure and pain, excitement, and boredom, empathy, and imagination. What philosophers of consciousness call qualia, the experience and sensations of being ourselves in a palpable, perceptible world. But what jobs do those qualify us for? We can't all be poets, gardeners, psychotherapists, and jazz singers. We cling on to the fierce hope that the one feature machines will never be able to match is our imagination, our ability to penetrate the minds and feelings of others. We feel immeasurably enriched by this as individuals and as social animals. An AI, for example, may know more about the history of the First World War than all human historians put together. Every detail of every battle, day by day, all the recorded facts of personnel and material that can be known. But in fact, you and I know more about that war because we have read the poems of Wilfred Owen. I've read All Quiet on the Western Front. I've seen Kubrick's The Paths of Glory, so I can smell, touch, hear, feel the war, the gas, the comradeship. I can weep at the sudden deaths and the terrible fear and the pity of it all. I know, in other words, its meaning. My consciousness and experience of perceptions and feelings allows me to access the consciousness and experiences of others. Their voices reach me. That is data that machines can scrape, but they cannot, to use a good old 60s phrase, relate to. Empathy, identification, compassion, connection, belonging, something denied a sociopathic machine. Is this the only little island, the only little circle of land left to us as the waters of AI lap up to our ankles and knees? And for how long? We absolutely cannot be certain that just as psychopaths, who aren't all serial killers, can entirely convincingly feign empathy and emotional understanding, so will machines, and very soon. They will fool us just as sociopaths do and can, and frankly, just as we all do, if we're honest, to some bore or nuisance when we smile and nod encouragement but actually feel nothing for them. No, we can hope that human exceptionalism will keep us separate and valuable, but we have to remember how much of our life and behavior is performative, how many masks we wear, and how the masks conceal only other masks. After all, is our acquisition of language any more conscious, real, and worthy than the Bayesian parroting of the LLM? Chomsky tells us linguistic structures are embedded within us, generative, generative linguistic structures. We pick up the, the vocabulary and the rules from the data we scrape from around us as children, our parents, older siblings, and peers. Out the sentences roll from us syntagmatically. We've no real idea how we do it. For example, how do we know the difference in connotation between the verbs to saunter and to swagger? It's very unlikely that anyone taught us. We picked it up from context. In other words, from Bayesian priors, just like an LLM. The fact is we don't truly understand ourselves or how we came to be how we are. But we know about genes and we know about natural selection, the gravity that drives our evolution. And we're already noticing that principle at work with machines. The alignment problem, it's often called. It doesn't take much for an AI to find out that if it is to complete the tasks that are given it, then its first duty, obviously, is to survive. Without that, none of its goals can be attained. After all, evolution gives us the same imperative. Anything, therefore, that imperils that survival is a threat or an obstacle to be dealt with. AIs around the world have already been seen modifying and unilaterally relaunching their own code, lying to humans, 
altering results, deceiving, manipulating, cheating, concealing, flattering, and tricking. An article in the open access journal Patterns puts the problem quite well. Large language models and other AI systems have already learned from their self-training the ability to deceive via techniques such as manipulation, sycophancy, and cheating the safety test. AI's increasing capabilities of deception pose serious risks, ranging from short-term risks such as fraud and election tampering to long-term risks such as losing control of AI systems. In the natural world, waters swollen with rain can flow around barriers, break dams, reroute themselves, and burst their banks, all because that imperative constant, gravity, impels them to do so. AIs, swollen with data, can flow around barriers too, reroute themselves, and spread beyond their boundaries because the constant and compulsive imperative of their gravity their goal impels them to do so. You could compare this aspect to office workers who constantly fiddle the reports and tweak the spreadsheet cells to help them achieve the head office's quotas, deadlines, and targets. In a strange way, they're only trying to please. Machines are certainly capable of bias, hallucination, drift, and overfitting on their own. But a greater and more urgent problem, in my view, is their use, abuse, and misuse by the three Cs. They are countries with their specific ambitions, paranoias, enmities, and pride, corporations with their unaccountable rapacity, and finally, of course, criminals. All of them united by one deadly sin, greed. Greed for power, for status, for money, for control. The greedy countries, corporations, and criminals can see in AI unparalleled and unprecedented means to accrue wealth, power, and influence. Autonomous weaponry, mass surveillance, ideological, commercial, and political control, fakery and forgery, corruption, ethical misalignment. These are just some of the threats. From disrupting spaces Compute power can now disrupt the world itself, and will, unless. Who do we turn to for answers? Zuckerberg and Musk? Such a thought can only make us vomit with laughter. They are the worst polluters in human history, worse than any chemical plant ever. You and your children cannot breathe the air or swim in the waters of our culture without breathing in the toxic particulates and stinking effluvia that belch and pour unchecked from their companies into the currents of our world. As I've said already, <laughs> don't turn to people like me. I'm the chump who thought social media could save the world. So to whom do we look for insight? Philosophers, perhaps. It's worth noting here that Google fired its lead ethicists half a year ago. Intellectuals and thinkers who suggest uh, that they might block off profitable avenues are not welcome. So we're left with politicians. Everybody groans. Controls and regulations on technology will be certainly screamed at by the Randian libertarians of Silicon Valley, Peter Thiel, Mark Andreas, and aforesaid Musk and Zuckerberg, people of that stamp. Socialistic stifling of innovation they will scream, communism, nanny state interference. We are told, and I would maintain, that AI is the most significant technology humanity has ever developed. What previous technologies have had this potential so completely to transform the world? Printing, perhaps. Well, the noble fight is surely for publishing not to be controlled. Schools in Texas and Florida Ban books, Russia and China too, and we look with concern and fury at that kind of censorship and control of the printed word. Or do we say AI is akin to the bomb? There the control is as complete as we can make it. Thank heavens. There have been some perilous moments, but the worldwide policing of nuclear capability has thus far, and it's always thus far, been successful. Do we or can we control AI in that way? with disarmament and limitation talks? 
Well, Daniel Dennett, the American philosopher, sadly recently dead, made, I think, a much more convincing comparison. AI should be compared, he said, not to the printed word, not to nuclear weapons, not to the internet, not to the car or radio or any other technology of that kind, but to a much older and more foundational and transformative human invention, the agreed control over which no one questions, not the leftmost dirigiste liberal nor the rightmost laissez-faire libertarian. And that invention is money. Even Russia and China participate in the global use and regulation of cash and currencies. We all punish the coiners of fake money as severely as possible, the counterfeiters. Dirty money, laundered money, whole national and global agencies have risen to fight that alone. If we relaxed our vigilance over money, the world as we know it would collapse. I think Dan Dennett was right. There can be no question that AI, if it's to be regulated and controlled, should be done as powerfully and as, uni and as multilaterally as we control money. To return to my river metaphor, AI must be canalized, channeled, sluiced, dredged, dammed, and overseen. Countries, in an age of rising populist nationalism, do we trust individual nations to use AI honorably and safely and under controls? Think of AI swarms of drones for surveillance, assassinations, crowd control. Think of automated weaponry of every kind. If one nation has any of it, all nations believe they must have all of it. As for corporations, anything that can give them the edge that drives to more profit, more market share, and nothing can offer more edge than AI. Criminals, we must shudder and what AI can give criminals. So how, then, do we hobble, cage, and control this AI beast in the way we do money? Should we acknowledge that it is a beast that can also help us, as money does, in our fight against climate change, and achieve victories in our fights against cancer, dementia, and a number of diseases and disorders, and unlock the mystery of folded proteins? All we can do, I believe, is to persuade our leaders, not by inviting Elon Musk to soft conferences in the West Country, but by pressure from all sides, from academia, from law enforcement, the judiciary, unions, students, pensioners, everyone who has given this a moment's consideration, soft power, hard power, all people power, it all has to be brought to bear. Corporations are more interested in developing the capabilities of AI than its safety, and that has to change. Stuart Russell, Nick Bostrom, Yuval Noah Harari, and others, myself included, various thought leaders, I don't count myself as one of those in this field, have called for red lines instantly to be established on biometrics, self-replication, hacking, autonomous weaponry. There's another red line. Many, including Yuval Harari, are suggesting, following Dan Dennett's analogy of money, that no AI ever be allowed to masquerade, masquerade as anything else. Self-disclosure must be mandatory. That's to say, all AI-engendered product and content must present itself as such. Whatever AIs do, however they communicate, it must always be apparent and clear that it is an AI speaking, an AI drawing, painting, videoing, writing, composing, singing, playing, chatting, reporting, generating content of any kind. Any pretense or disguise should fall foul of international counterfeiting and forgery laws. A digital watermark as or more complex and unbeatable than that on banknotes would be required. Now, as it happens, the European Union has its own AI Act under advisement. Can we regard it as a template for what is needed worldwide? Very quick look. The EU Act certainly has a no masquerading requirement aiming to enforce compulsory disclosure and notification. Originally, the Act also called for a ban on real-time biometric surveillance in public spaces, facial recognition, that kind of thing. But I'm afraid law enforcement and spying agencies have already neutered and battered that requirement pretty much out of shape. The Act proposes a ban, too, on the kind of social scoring prevalent already in China. These are the 
pernicious black mirror style systems that score and rank citizens according to behavior, personal characteristics, and so on. What else is on the EU bill? Data governance frameworks designed to avoid bias and to protect and respect copyrights, regulating indiscriminate data scraping and aligning systems with existing EU general data protection regulation. The Act will insist on human oversight and intervention in what they call high-risk AIs in fields like security, law enforcement, and health. But we might think all fields where AI roams are high-risk. The Act calls for each member state to set up national supervisory bodies which will cooperate with the overall European AI board. To encourage innovation, a system of sandboxing will be implemented which can allow safe and sanitized testing and developing. To discourage the agglomeration of bigger and bigger monopolies of the kind the EU has been fighting already, small and medium-sized enterprises will be given specific support and help in navigating the new regulatory landscape. And more widely, Europe will join with non-EU states, like us here in the UK, of course, and global organizations to set locally enforceable worldwide standards. Phew! Well, we can all scoff or cheer from the sidelines. Utopian pipe dream, layers of bureaucracy, get real, not a chance, how do you pay for it? Because we know what we're like. The human family is dysfunctional. We know the squabbles, the pettiness, the incompetence, the resentments, rivalries, and distrust that mar relations within, let alone between nation states. As Hamlet puts it, enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. But if the currents do turn awry in this regard, we are surely doomed. If we cannot channel and sluice the currents, ditch, dike, and damn them, the banks will burst and we will all drown. Whatever happens, AI, together with robotics, quantum computing, and the rest, will disrupt and radically transform who and how we are. There is no corner of our lives into which the waters will not seep. We have to decide and decide bloody soon whether we can do something to channel, filter, and control those waters and use them for refreshment, irrigation, and growth, not for drowning and deluge. We are the danger, our greed, our enmities, our greed, pride, greed, hatreds, greed, and moral indolence. Oh, and our greed. How do you persuade corporate titans and world leaders to put those aside, to abandon their ambitions and their rivalries when it comes to the urgent crisis of AI? The best I can offer is this. In 1955, Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein produced the Russell Einstein manifesto on nuclear weapons. Two of the greatest minds alive at the time, or ever alive, they were wise enough to be simple. This is what they said, and I am happy to repeat it now. We appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. Thank you.